Good evening, everyone. The American Horticultural Society is pleased to welcome you to today's program, Conversations with Great American Gardeners, featuring a dialogue between Claire Sawyers and Holly Shimitsu. For the past 70 years, the American Horticultural Society's Great American Gardener Awards have recognized excellence in plant professions. Speakers in this year's webinar series are selected from among the awardees. These webinars and all AHS programs share about the critical role of plants, gardens, and green spaces in creating healthy, livable communities and a sustainable planet. I may be a new face for some of you. My name is Courtney Allen. I joined the American Horticultural Society earlier this year as Director of National Programs. I come with a background and a passion in gardens programming, landscape history, and museum education. Prior to joining AHS, I directed and managed educational programs for the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University, Native Plant Trust, and the Huntington Gardens. I'm delighted to be part of the AHS team and to grow our national programs in exciting new ways. As we begin tonight's program, a reminder that we are in webinar format. This is a format used for large audiences. We have a sizable crowd this evening. In webinar format, only the presenters have their cameras and their mics enabled, but audience members are welcome to submit your questions at any time during the program using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll address as many questions as our time allows at the end of the program. I'm pleased to introduce our conversation facilitator for the evening, Holly Shimitsu. Holly has been a lover of plants, gardens, and nature since her childhood. After studying horticulture at Penn State, she worked in European gardens for over three years. Upon her return, she became the first curator of the National Herb Garden at the U.S. National Arboretum and received her Master's of Science in Horticulture from the University of Maryland. She worked as Managing Director of the Lewis Ginter Botanical Garden in Richmond, Virginia, and then was Executive Director of the U.S. Botanic Garden for 15 years. Currently, Holly is on the board of the American Horticultural Society and the American Botanical Council. She heads the Environmental Committee in her town and writes for their newspaper. She wrote and illustrated her first children's book, Figgy and Fiona Search for a Home, and is now working on her second book. Holly has received many awards and honors for her work. And for over 10 years, Holly was one of the hosts of the Victory Garden television show on PBS. Welcome to Holly, who will introduce tonight's featured guest, Claire Sawyers. Thank you, Courtney. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Claire Sawyers, who won our most wonderful award this year, the Liberty Hyde Bailey Award. Claire is director of the Scott Arboretum, and she's been director there since 1990. And prior to that, she worked at the Mount Cuba Center for the Study of Piedmont Flora, in Hokesson, Delaware for seven years. She has two master's degree, one from um, in horticulture from Purdue, Purdue University. And then she has a master's from the University of Delaware where she was a Longwood graduate fellow. Claire's gardened in Japan, France, Belgium, in addition to the US. She also served as a commissioner for the accreditation program of the American Association of Museums from 2004 to 2010. Her fantastic book, The Authentic Garden, Five Principles for Gardening, Cultivating a Sense of Place was published in 2007 by Timber Press. I first met Claire when uh, we were both uh, gardening gardeners in Europe and um, she came through the garden where I was working at Wisley. And um, that was a long time ago, but we were both <laughs> really uh, you know, keen students. And so it's really my pleasure to introduce Claire Sawyers. Claire. Thank you, Holly. Uh, I am glad that it's now fairly dark here because it was such a glorious day today. Any of you who are chiming in from uh, the Philadelphia area, I think, you know, it's one of these magical late summer, early fall days. So uh, I'm hoping that you're you're not resenting kind of giving up outdoor gardening time and coming in to join us. So delighted to be here. And it is fun. Holly and I over the years have 
kind of reminisced about our time, a very, very formative time working in Europe in other gardens. Uh, and uh, as I always remind her, I met her husband because he came back to Kelmfeld Arboretum uh, to get together with Monsieur de Belder in order to secure a diamond ring to propose to Holly. So uh, it's a very fond memory for me. And I think, yes, I have known Holly and Osam from the very first uh, international trip and really the first uh, full-time gardening position that I had there. Yeah. So well, one of the things I'd love to talk about, Claire, is um, working at the Scott Arboretum of Swarthmore College. You are developing um, this botanic garden while you're also on a fabulous campus. And, and what is really unique about that? And, and, and what are your thoughts about being part of a, a botanic garden and a, and a campus? So yeah, I think we're kind of an unusual model and certainly any of, our, any of our volunteers who are listening in tonight, delighted you're there and this will not be news to you, but Swarthmore College is a liberal arts college. And so uh, a lot of times our professional peers and colleagues come to see the Arboretum and they'll ask us questions like, oh, how many horticulture majors do you have? And I go, zero. And then they go, oh, oh, well, how about your landscape architecture department? How many LA ma majors do you have? And I say zero. So there's this um, kind of, in a way, a disconnect uh, in people's mind's eye, at least, that uh, an arboretum with the kind of breadth and the depth that we have is situated on a liberal arts um, campus. Uh, and so we, we don't have any horticulture students. And the original concept for the Scott Arboretum laid out by Mr. and Mrs. Scott uh, was to really serve the community at large, to be a display, a public visual display of the best plants for gardeners to create edifying home landscapes in. And so it's really been in the last, uh, I'm going to say, six or seven years that we have begun to try to figure out how to truly engage some of the best and brightest minds, the students who come to Swarthmore, uh, it, it's incredibly difficult to get in here. They're all very bright. So how to engage students that aren't thinking about horticulture, how to engage them in the mission of the Arboretum. Um, and so um, a handful of years ago, we were able to create a new position, Campus Engagement Coordinator. And that position is filled by Sue McQueen, and her mission in life with us is to develop programs that can get the attention and the participation of Swarthmore College students. So uh, I think this has become increasingly important because uh, it's a worldwide trend, right? Students or young people are growing up in urban environments and the time that they have to connect with nature, the exposure that they have to agriculture, to amenity horticulture, I feel like it is getting less and less. And so students that come here, it may be the first time that they've experienced the Eastern deciduous landscape, that they have been uh, a part of an organization with a 300 to 400 acre campus. Uh, and we're well aware of the impact that that can have. Um, I'm, I might be getting too far off track here, but Several years ago, uh, we used to have two events when students first started. One was planting a tree in the Crumb Woods. And the idea was that it would expose them to our natural area and they would take some ownership in it. And for many years, uh, even before I started here, so probably four decades, we have had a first year student welcome plant bash. So we give each student a chance to come over and pick out a house plant to put in their room and grow. And I jokingly like to say, well, we know then that Swarthmore students get their hands dirty at least once in the four years that they're with us because we have them potted up, right? And our very uh, helpful volunteers, I say, don't do it for them. You can walk them through it, you can show them, you can mentor, but don't do it for them. Let them do it so they take ownership of it. So one year after we had done those two events in the first week, uh, we had students write a haiku about their kind of experience. And it was both uh, edifying and horrifying that, that one student said, my first two plants ever, right? 
So we think of these as kind of symbolic gestures, but in that case, it was the first time a student had taken ownership or really been the cultivator of those two plants. So for those of us who have been in horticulture our whole life, it's it's kind of shocking, right? Oh, yeah. Um, so um, we now have a variety of pop-up programs for students. A lot of them are I think fun and light ways to engage them in horticulture. So maybe it's making something out of, maybe it's dogwood twigs that we've cut off. And so they're making a wreath out of uh, things that we've pruned out of the garden, or they're learning about the pawpaws that we've harvested off of a tree. So I think food is a way to connect to them uh, and then providing some release from the academic pressure that they feel here. Something where they can be creative, where they're not trying to earn a score or a grade. Um, I think these are ways that we've been able to engage them. So I also just uh, kind of coincidentally today, I was looking over some applications. Uh, we have a gardening position open right now. And so in terms of the impact that a campus can have on someone who isn't thinking about horticulture and they're engaged in a liberal arts education, uh, this is a, an applicant who applied from Smith College. And uh, Smith, I think, is really the first uh, college in the country uh, that developed their campus per se as a garden or botanical garden or an arboretum. But it really was to support the academics. Uh, we like to say we're the first campus arboretum to uh, serve the public at large. Uh, but this candidate said, um, beginning my career in horticulture as an undergraduate interning at the Smith Botanic Garden, I can attest to the significant impact a living campus can have on its students, academic community, and community worldwide. So I think uh, uh, the other uh, opportunity that we have in this distinct model by being situated on a college campus uh, I like to say we are uh, perhaps the most accessible public garden in the Philadelphia area because we don't have a fence around the property. We don't charge admission. We don't have parking fees. And you can come at five o'clock in the morning or you can stay until seven o'clock to capture those golden area, uh, hours for photography. And so... Um, by being that accessible, it means we're serving kind of as a town square, kind of as a community space, kind of as a park, kind of as a campus, and kind of as an arboretum. And so it draws many people here. And a lot of times we say we have unintentional visitors. They're coming for a concert. They're coming for a sports event. They're coming for a lecture. And suddenly they go, oh, whoa, look at that tree, or oh, look at this garden. And so it's a way to pull them into horticulture and have an impact on them. That's so great. I wanted to mention also, I was at an event in Washington, D.C., and I met um, a person who, who said, oh, I went to Swarthmore College. And at the time, I couldn't care at all about trees or nature or anything. And now, you know, 15 years later, I realized the incredible impact it had on me. And so it sort of came, it really came back. And I, I think that is an element for so many people um, who don't realize it at the time, don't you? Yeah. So we've had some funny stories, alumni weekend, right? Alumni come back and they will tell us kind of what you're saying. It's like, oh, I was oblivious to things while I was here. And now that I have my own garden or I'm now involved with a corporate landscape and, you know, this is part of my responsibility, um, they they want to learn more and they want to um, kind of rewind and, and back up and think about their time here. So it's kind of a running joke that buildings on the campus are not well labeled. And so uh, some of these students and admissions people will say, yeah, come to a college where the plants are better labeled than the buildings. And so <laughs> alumni leave and they go, you know, I went to wor work for X, Y, or Z Corporation and I would walk around the campus going, where are the labels? Why don't they have a label? <laughs> That's so funny. I love that. Well, what are some of the... Um, 
parts of your landscape garden that um, have really developed while you've been there. And I want a side note to say one of the areas I love is your amphitheater. It's so beautiful. Just there it is, that amphitheater. It's it's and if you go there and you're the only person, it's like this meditative spiritual experience. It's so beautiful. So yeah, um, just to take off on that a little bit, Holly, I if we have a masterpiece here, it is the Scott Outdoor Amphitheater, even though it's not a plantsman's garden it is an incredible incredible example of designing in harmony with nature and many times i've said it actually reminds me of japanese gardens because it is about plants and stone and space and line and form as opposed to color and exuberance and yet it is pleasing in every season and so uh, what you're seeing, the backdrop behind me, is a photograph that we took during uh, the Woody Plant Conference this past summer. And so we encourage uh, participants of the conference to take their bag lunch and go over and sit on the tiers of uh, the amphitheater um, to enjoy it. But um, the tulip trees uh, form the canopy uh, over the amphitheater. We're starting to see some yellow color, and so they will fall and create kind of a yellow carpet in the fall. When all the leaves are off, if we have a snow, it's wonderful because you see the tears, the stone tears with the white uh, kind of cutting a line through the, the white snow. Uh, spring, uh, fresh green coming out on the tulip trees. And in the summer, it's a very shady, as you say, peaceful, tranquil place to go and kind of just commune with nature or yes. just to um, take a breath. So. Uh, I can't take any credit for the development of the amphitheater. It's really John Wister who had this vision early on, and he worked with Thomas Sears, a prominent landscape architect who did work at a number of Philadelphia gardens. Uh, they went to Harvard together, design school at Harvard, and so uh, when this idea got started, uh, John was asked to bring in outside design help. He, he turned to his classmate, Thomas Sears, to come up with the, the scheme that you see here. And um, there are alternate drawings that were done by other architects that make it look like a Greek or Roman uh, tragedy theater, complete with Italian, Italianate cypress and stucco walls, and so, and not a tulip tree in sight. And so, uh, every time I see that alternate plan, I am grateful to those who were here who saw the wisdom in this design in terms of integrating with the crumb woods and nature and just the simplicity of it. So um, I think the, the college, in a way, the, the Arboretum was well perceived or it seemed like a good fit, despite what I just said earlier about us not having a horticulture department and and being developed as a curricular resource. Um, the, the Quaker values of uh, respect for nature made the administration, I think, receptive for the Arboretum to be established here. Um, and when, when John Wister started, the Arboretum didn't come along until 1929, 1930. So the college had been going since the 1860s um, when this idea was formed by uh, the Scots who both attended Swarthmore College and are graduates of the college. And so if I think about, we're going to be 95 next year. So if I think about the history of the Arboretum and we go back to the 20s, John Wister had a vision uh, master plan for the Arboretum. And it was based on kind of gardening needs at that time. And it was trying to figure out good plants, right? Um, ornamental cherries were brand new. People didn't understand what they were and how, why we were getting excited about them in this country. So there were a lot of plants that were yet unknown as ornamental plants, uh, breeding programs, selecting programs. There were not 40,000 cultivars of daylilies then um, or hostas. And so uh, the, the original focus was as our mission says, to be a visual catalog, a display. Uh, and so John laid out collections that would be, here are the hydrangeas, here are the viburnums, here are the crab apples. 
so that a lay person could easily come and go, that's what I'm looking for. That's the habit that I want. That's the color that I want. Okay, let me get the name of that. That's the, the plant that I want to add to my garden. And so we have this wonderful legacy from John Wister, uh, still of these very strong ornamental groups that are concentrated in areas of the campus. But as we think about the trends and the values of gardening, we have we've moved on, right? Now we can order any plant um, online, get it shipped to us, more choices than we can manage to know, right? And so I think in phases, after kind of getting an idea of collections, there was a phase of then trying to say, how you put it together? Yeah. How do you create a mood? How do you create a theme, a pleasing landscape? And so I would say the next phase of development, in a sense, um, revolved around uh, putting it all together uh, with themes. So a fragrance garden, a winter garden, a pollinator's garden, uh, a complete landscape, not just a catalog of plants. And I think now in, I'm going to say the last 10 years, um, kind of getting to the native, non-native, uh, with the focus on sustainability, we no longer need to conquer nature, right? We need to nurture nature. And so I think uh, in many of the efforts that we have taken on and that is of interest uh, across the nation or around the world with gardeners, uh, it's how do we contribute to that greater good? How mm. do we increase biodiversity? How do we reduce chemical input? How do we help the ecological uh, processes? And so I would say in the last handful of years, our efforts have revolved around things like um, developing an organic lawn, turning lawn into meadow, uh, working with the college on building projects so that they meet living building challenges and uh, lead certified uh, programs. So using horticulture to solve problems like stormwater mitigation, energy consumption. So trees, preserving trees around buildings, shading buildings, putting green roofs on buildings. So I think in the, in the time that I have been here, yes, we're still interested in collections. Yes, we still um, try to maintain good collections of good plants. And yes, we want to create evocative gardens on a scale that homeowners can relate to, even though we are a college campus. Uh, and then to show how to be good stewards, um, how to be conscientious about our role as gardeners uh, in stewards um, of the planet and our surroundings and the environment. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I mean, I've been there quite a few times and it is a wow place. And you've been able to incorporate all of these um, environmentally sensitive and ecological aspects while still having the impact of a of a garden to kind of take your breath away and so it can it can happen i think it's important to recognize that you can do those good things you describe and also incorporate beauty with it so it's you know it's even a learning process for us right i feel like um, home gardeners have been trying to turn their lawns into meadows for what 20 30 years now and you know, these stories about neighbors kind of getting citations because they're not mowing their lawns, you know, how to psychologically make that look comfortable. So, you know, mowing the edge around it. And I'm reminded of that because really one of our newest landscapes, which is a large landscape here, uh, is around Singer Hall. So this is a, probably the biggest building that's been added to campus and it houses biology, psychology and engineering. And so the concept was to create a landscape around that building that could be used uh, as a teaching tool for the biology department inside. Um, so we worked with Olin Partners, a prominent uh, landscape architectural firm in Philadelphia. And the idea was developed to create synoptic landscapes around that building that represent 
um, natural landscapes, um, ecological associations that are within, I think we said, 100 miles of Swarthmore. And so we have Piedmont Woods, we have the New Jersey uh, Pine Barrens and New Jersey Swamps. And so uh, this is a challenge for us because it's really an, a small landscape, right? We don't have acres to develop uh, pine woods or oak forests. So we're trying to have representative plants of those different ecosystems and yet emulate the processes of nature. So this is still a young landscape. And we started out by saying, okay, we're not gonna cut the grasses back. We're gonna, we're gonna leave them so that it looks like nature. So it's a very different visual aesthetic than much of the rest of the campus. And so we do have people going, oh my gosh, what are you doing here? Why aren't you taking care of this landscape? Or, oh, yeah. this is, you know, this doesn't look like the Scott Arboretum. What's going on here? So interpretation is critical, right? Absolutely. And and as we learn, um, so we have these debates now where uh, we put in um, some uh, uh, Virginia pines and a top died out of one of them almost immediately. And so we said, okay, let's not cut it out. Let's not prune it like it's a garden specimen because death is a part of nature, right? Plants. Right, it's a habitat tree. Right. And so it's, it's a bit challenging for us to figure out what is the level of intervention, what is going to work to preserve the landscape and to make it look like nature. Um, but one of the fun things we had to cut down some notable trees in uh, to create the footprint for that building and we decided to keep many of the stumps and create a stumpery out of that oh so, nice right try to turn uh make lemonade out of lemons as they say and so now we're kind of saying is it possible for us to keep everything that's generated on that on out of that landscape on that landscape and uh it turns out that it's giving us new educational opportunities because we have logs in there. Uh, so in some of our youth programming, they'll go over and, and flip a log up, right? And now we see these incredible beetles that are eating the logs. And so mm -hmm. I think gardening with that kind of total cycle is where many people are going. And so again, it gives us the opportunity and is reflected in the efforts that we're taking on here. Uh, but as I say, it can be a bit of a jolt in terms of the aesthetic and the expectation uh, and communicating, here's what we're trying. Will it work? Will it not work? Or how does it strike people? So. Well, it's great that you, you're, you're, you're a leader. You're leading the way with that landscape. And I believe eventually people will get it and, and get used to it and understand the reasoning. We hope and so. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, I think, you know, like Pete Uldoff landscapes and a lot of others, you know, it's beauty and death and the cycle. So um, I wonder, you know, you worked at uh, Mount Cuba, which is also such a fabulous garden. How did that um, influence you, Claire? You know, it's funny because that really is about nature and trying to emulate nature, right? It's a uh... Well, when I was there, um, the the focus for it to become devoted to native plants was articulated. Uh, Dick Lighty was really the first director there to work with Mrs. Copeland and form that as a direction, even though it was a colonial style mansion with very formal gardens. Originally, um, the passion went towards native plants, wildflowers and naturalistic design. And so um, I think in a lot of ways, uh, working there and of course being a Longwood fellow and having exposure to Longwood, it really was striving for kind of perfection and maintenance, uh, trying to hit high marks there. Um, so I will say a lot of people, because this area is so rich, as you know, in incredible public gardens, uh, Winneter, the Morris Arboretum, Tyler Arboretum, Mount Cuba, Hagley, Winneter, you know, there's just a ton of incredible gardens that are here. Um, and so um, that kind of uh, exposure to maintenance, uh, I think, kind of raised the level in terms of what I felt like we were trying to, to strive for here. And so 
again, we have this reaction of when people haven't been to the region and they go, well, I only have three days to be there. I want to go to Chanticleer. And of course, I want to see Longwood. Why would I want to go to a college campus? You know, there's so it, it's kind of nice in that I feel like um, frequently we exceed expectations. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's it's so it, you go and you're like, un, it's unbelievable, really. It's so great. So I like that too. It's good to not be high on the list and people come and then they're just astounded. So for those of you who may be listening in that you haven't been here before, I hasten to add that right now, as my boss says, we have an unprecedented level of construction going on. Oh, and so uh, the beauty and the tranquility that I think many of us are very proud about and enjoy here, um, we have a lot of construction fencing up right now and a lot of soil mounds. And part of that, again, is because of the emphasis on um, striving for sustainability. We have a a major energy renewal plan that's going on. So uh, one of our large lawn areas is um, essentially a soil mound right now because 600 geothermal wells have been added to that part of the lawn. So there is still plenty of beauty to see here, but uh, just a word of warning, um, it has been a pretty uh, intense period with a lot of construction going on. Uh, with buildings being renovated and energy, major any energy infrastructure being um, updated and uh, connected to the buildings. Well, also, I wanted to mention to everybody your book, which I have, and I love The Authentic Garden, Five Principles for Cultivating Place. Can you tell us about each of those principles briefly? Sure. Um, let me let me start by saying, uh, this really came out of my experience of working in Japan with a Japanese landscaper there. And when I came back from that experience, you know, I started lecturing about Japanese gardens. And I think many people who go to experience the unique beauty of Japanese gardens, we fall in love with it, right? It really resonates with us. And we come home and we go, ooh, I want a Japanese garden. And I felt that that was really a cultural disjunct. You know, it's like, no, that we don't really want a Japanese garden. We want a garden that impacts us like Japanese gardens impact us. Yeah. And so I feel like, uh, you know, we've gone through this a uh, number of times in the gardening development in this country, right? Uh, you take... Uh, Pierre Dupont, uh, the Dupont families, you know, they went to Europe and they came back and they recreated Italian gardens. We go off to England, we come back, we create English gardens. We go off to France, we fall in love, we come back. You know, there have been periods in our history where Americans have fallen in love with different culturally strong gardens and then we want to recreate them. And there's mm -hmm. a bit of a cultural disconnect. And so I, I think what I really have tried to do with that book is say, why do those gardens resonate with us? Whether it is Italianate or French or English or Japanese, what, what are the qualities that we fall in love with and how can we apply them in a way that makes sense to our culture, to our landscape and to our, our heritage? And so um, the, the principles really, uh, I think, as I say, they came about from my reflecting on what it was about great gardens that we can distill and then apply in American ways. So the first one is really kind of work with what you've been given, right? Don't, don't look overseas, but look right here. What is it that you've been given that's unique about your site? And so you know, we're always kind of the grass is greener on the other side. If we have a sunny spot, we want to add trees for shade. If we have a shady spot, we lament the fact that we can't grow sun loving perennials. And so look at your situation and and celebrate what's unique about it, whether it's wet or dry or sunny or shady. So work with what you've been given. Uh, and then I think the, the second one is um, essentially deriving beauty from function. 
So I feel like we all have limited space and resources, and there is this notion that we need to go out and buy stuff to put in our garden to make it interesting, right? We need an objet, we need a sculpture, we need a um, to add interest to the garden. And I think gardens that are impactful and have integrity, it's taking a look at the, if you will, necessary evils and making them beautiful. So the example that I like, uh, that I think is really kind of quintessential right to the essence of this is, how many of you take a picture of your driveway and say that's the most beautiful feature of your home property, right? We, we don't. Um, and so how do we uh, use materials and treatment so that your driveway becomes a plaza when your car is not there, that's a garden room, but it accommodates the car when it comes home to sleep at night. So all those things, the, the barbecue grill, the, oh, the compost bin, you know, all of those things that serve a function in your garden, think about how they can add beauty and interest in and of themselves. Um, the third principle that I advocate is using what I call humble or indigenous materials. That may not mean inexpensive, right? But so, for instance, stone, right? Making a, a stone wall is more expensive than a preformed block wall, but it is an indigenous or natural material that I think then marries two elements in the garden. So, uh, in some cases, using humble and indigenous material is the way to go because we can't afford expensive things. So using natural sticks to provide trellising or supports for plants, or using a discarded material like old, we probably can't do this anymore, but in the old days, oyster shells or um, shells that were in essence an industrial waste material created very kind of site appropriate pathways that linked to that specific area as examples. Number four, I think this is where Japanese gardens really do enthrall us, and that is the way they marry the inside and the outside, mm -hmm. right? Many times when you're going to visit a famous Japanese garden, you're actually entering a temple and sitting on a veranda or sitting in a room and then looking out at the garden. So the two are inseparable, that indoor-outdoor relationship. And so there are some amazing examples in this country that, of course, we can't um, apply to our home landscape, but they can serve as inspiration. Things like Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water. Yes. Uh, right? The architecture emulates the waterfall. Every room, you can step step, step out directly um, into nature. Uh, window boxes that are planted with mosses and ferns and uh, corners to uh, the windows that have no beam in them. So it's a direct connection to the view outside. So we can look at premier examples like that and I think translate some of that. So the humble example that I give uh, for my own little bungalow in media, I don't have curtains on my windows so that every window makes a connection to the outdoors. So every window I think of as kind of a picture frame and I try to look out to say, okay, there's a nice view to oh, I don't know, my Frank Lenia or to my bird bath or to, you know, whatever it is outdoors. Um, and then finally, uh, it, it's the concept of involving the visitor, engaging as many senses as possible and physically involving the visitors. So, you know, if I think about kind of a typical American backyard, you open the back door and there's a big lawn and then there's a ring of plants around that, or maybe there's a few trees. And so if I say, come and look at my back garden, you open the door and you go, okay, I've seen it. I don't need to do anything more. There's nothing that pulls you into the garden and there is no sequence of experiential learning and so uh, even small gardens that do this effectively, it may be just a pathway around the house. And as you take that journey around the house, each side of the house offers something different. Mm. Um, and anybody who's been to my house, they know I have 
low hanging pine boughs right by the front door. And so part of that is that's engagement, right? I notice that pine tree every time I'm kind of coming in because it's right in front of me. So I think grasses that lean over pathways, you know, where we can reach out and or we can't resist reaching out and kind of feeling the plumes of the grasses yeah. and engaging touch, right? So we think of gardens as a visual, visual experience, but I think those that are most impactful, they, they provide sound. They've got water trickling or something happening. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sight, sound, fragrance, of course, uh, touch. Um, and then this kind of sequential discovery, sense of discovery, sense of mystery, um, creating uh, an experience that pulls you in and pulls you through the garden. Uh, so thinking, going back to the campus here, while we don't have one path that takes you through, what I hope people feel is that, oh, I'm in the Meta Sequoia LA. Wow, this is different from the area that I just passed through. Oh, yeah. Now I'm looking down on the Glade Garden and I'm seeing water and it was hidden and it's got a different personality. So I feel like if people wander the campus here, it engages because it pulls you in and gets you to notice new and different elements and different styles and different themes. That's right. So and one of the things related to that point in J Japanese gardens that I love is that concept of hide and reveal. And mm -hmm. so you're pulled in and then you're surprised because you didn't even know that this was there. And so you get these, you know, hidden, hidden things as you make your journey. That goes back to the amphitheater because this is a large space. It can accommodate up to 2000 people if we put chairs in there as we did for many years for commencement. And it's very near the original building of the college, Parish Hall. So I like to lead groups into the overlook and not look at the amphitheater, just walk in and then step on the other side and not say anything. Mm. And if the group hasn't been here before, it is very common for people, you know, they'll kind of come into the lookout, they'll look at me, you know, waiting to hear what I'm going to say. And then they'll turn around and they will look here and they will go, oh, so it's this compression and release or yeah. hide and reveal this very large um, space. So good. It, it is, I think that's part of why it is so successful is the screening of it. You have no idea that it's there. Yeah. And then when you're led into it and it's revealed to you, yes. uh, you have this element of surprise and delight yeah love that well um changing course a little bit what um advice do you give to um young people who are interested in entering horticulture how do you how do you like to to guide them and and uh get them get them going in our field uh <clears throat> internships mm -hmm. volunteering um, so we, uh, we do uh, employ Swarthmore College students to work with staff here. And, um, I take great pride. I think we all take great pride when every once in a while we have a student who suddenly they're now pursuing uh, plant science or they're going on to, do internships or jobs in gardens. And so um, I've got some incredibly knowledgeable and uh, wonderful mentors, um, staff members on my staff. And so, I mean, I think most of us in horticulture, we can think back about somebody who influenced us in that way. You know, yeah. there, was, there was like a, 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 a moment or a, uh, an opportunity that we kind of go, oh, okay, um, this is what I want to do now. Um, and so I think um, I, I also like to say to interns, there's this concept of creating luck, right? You can, you can make luck. And I think that is reaching out to people, stretching yourself, doing things that you're maybe not comfortable with initially, um, so that you you can try that to see if it is something that resonates with you. 
uh, in a in a safe environment as an intern, right? You're trying things in that um, um, kind of setup um, that will um, give you a chance to to taste it without making a, a commitment to it necessarily. Uh, so I think with young folks today, you know, we we lament the fact that uh, horticulture is probably not as well known of a career path as it was when you and I were going through school. But here we see that students are deeply engaged with food, mm. and that's a good hook, not necessarily the kind of the focus of the arboretum, but it is a way for us to get horticulture to be of interest to them. So learning about food, how food is produced, uh, what are the implications of food production in this country, I feel like that is a, a powerful way to get uh, young people looking at horticulture and thinking about horticulture and the importance of horticulture. And of course, through sustainability, we have um, students that are in the environmental studies uh, curriculum here and taking on um, research projects that are related to sustainability. And some of those intersect with horticulture as we've talked about stormwater, woods management, natural area management, or crumb woods. Um, and so I think those are uh, perhaps areas where there there is growing interest in uh, young young people that is a, a connection and a pathway to horticulture. Well, I think um, maybe my last question, because I know we want to get two questions that have come in, but um, where do you see our gardens in the future? Yeah, we were kind of joking about this before everybody we were. So, yeah, um, looking in the crystal ball is never easy, right? No. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, the American Public Garden Association had a keynote speaker, uh, and it was how to think like a futurist. Um, Jane, mm -hmm, her last name is not coming to me now, but she's done TED Talks, and uh, it was a fascinating way to actually kind of wake up your brain to go, how do we think about the future? Um, how do we anticipate the future and predict the future uh, without spending gobs of money to hire the professionals to do that for us? And so um, what I was saying to Holly is that if I think about this kind of trend line that the Arboretum has been on here, the campus of the college, um, there are days that I think, hmm, well, Will lawns be acceptable in the future? Or will they be seen as missed opportunities where we could have all meadows or forest that have a higher uh, biodiversity uh, count or uh, sequester more carbon or sh do a better job of um, shading soil and buildings? Uh, and so balancing those needs, human needs against um, trends, thinking about some of the environmental issues that we're facing, I think that could lead us into a different, you know, it could be a continuum in the direction that we've started that would uh, make our landscapes look very different. Um, Doug Talame, I think, has a really, I'm sure many of you have heard him lecture on this, but I think he's been promoting this interesting concept of if Americans gave up just a small percentage of their lawn area and planted it in native plants, whether meadow or woods or you know, shrub borders, that it would be the largest national park in the country by far. And I mean, we've been talking about this kind of stuff for a long time, right? How to how to not have so many sterile lawns, acres of sterile lawns that consume energy and, you know, we have fertilizer runoff and all the kind of evils that go with having those kinds of landscapes. Uh, but we're still a long way from kind of getting that into our daily basis and our average approach to landscaping so yeah. uh so yeah i um 
Um, that's that's about as far as I can take that concept. Right. No, I I mean it's it's really impossible to know, but I I do agree. I mean that's the trajectory we're on. I think um, I don't think it's a fad or a cycle. I think it's because it's what what's needed. But I think it's not an easy or quick road mm -hmm. because it, the perception of a garden as all neat and tidy is it's a it's different and it's um it, it i think it'll be a gradual kind of kind of shift but i think um we'll i think we'll we'll see it in terms of horticulture i think um some of the art forms because uh uh you know gardens are getting smaller right we all can't afford an acre or two and so some of the art forms of working with plants um so things like bonsai, flower arranging. It does seem to me that they're, or, you know, little cactus gardens, container gardening, balcony gardening, right? So elevating that uh, chance to work on a smaller scale for our mental health and to bring plants into our life. Uh, you know, there've been some interesting developments, uh, you know, plants being grown. It's, a, it's actually a Jap, it started in Japan. I, I can't tell you the term for it now, but, you know, kind of hanging baskets with plants in them. Uh, and so that uh, if you think about the demands of bonsai and kind of the dedication that you can have to that, um, perhaps uh, that level of engagement on a reduced scale will take off for mental health and uh, to be able to cultivate plants. But mm -hmm. Well, I think that Courtney will probably want us to go into some questions. And <clears throat> so, Courtney, can I hand it over to you? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much, Claire and Holly. This There's so much fodder here. It's fantastic. Um, thank you to those of you who have put questions into the Q&A so far. Uh, if you have more questions, this is the opportunity to do it. You just press the button at the bottom of the screen and put your questions in. Uh, so both of the questions that have come through so far um, are about the construction that you mentioned, Claire. And one of the questions is um, on the Swarthmore College, how are some of your more important historical garden areas protected and what kind of work do you do with the college in order to ensure that? So really good question. Um, we, um, I think one of the unique things about the Arboretum is that it's very dynamic because it is a college campus. So we're constantly changing, right? That's a given, we're, we're changing. And it generally has given uh, the opportunity to the Arboretum to respond to new, new horticultural trends or desires. So new building goes in, now, now we have a chance to, to work in conjunction with that building to create a landscape and, and address something new. So it generally spins off new opportunities for us. However, uh, because we aren't a historic uh, property, there is there is nothing that is truly sacred, right? Everything could be impacted by the development of uh, the college. So one of my um, real concerns uh, is how do we protect hundred-year-old trees or our best trees, because in our lifetime, this is not something that you can recreate. And I think that depth of horticulture uh, from having 75, 50, 75, 90, 300 year old trees, those are getting more and more precious to us as human beings, right? They're just fewer and fewer of old growth forests and those kind of specimens. And so, one of the initiatives that Mary Tipping, our curator, and a host of other people have been involved in, uh, we started, I don't know, a handful of years ago, and it is, we're calling it the Heritage Tree Program. So it's, we are trying to objectively identify truly the best in our collection. We've got over 3,000 trees that we're evaluating, right? So whew, we got a lot of trees. So, well, you know, okay, if we cut down a few of them, right? It may not seem like a big deal. But 
if we cut down all of our biggest and oldest, then we're really losing something, right? And so how do we communicate that to a broad audience, to administrators at the college, to the community at large? How do we quickly and persuasively say, yeah, okay, it's an oak tree, but it's a 300-year-old oak tree, and it's the only 300-year-old oak tree you have. So maybe we really don't want to put a building there. And so we came up with this kind of matrix to say, um, how old is it? What is the condition of it? Uh, what is the rarity of it in our collection? What is the rarity of it on a world scale? And what is the cultural significance of it? Was it planted by a former president of the college? Was it planted by a dignitary? It, does it have meaning? Is it a dedicated tree? So those were criteria that we turned into numbers, right? Good condition, it gets 20 points. Fair condition, 15. So we turn it into points. And now we have a threshold to say, Okay, anything over 60 points, we are designating it a heritage tree. And I have been really gratified. It's kind of like saying it has the good housekeeping seal of approval, right? It's like a quick way. When we say heritage tree, it's a moniker that has been picked up by many people in the college community, in the construction, the facilities, contractors. Um, and I've had a wonderful supportive boss, um, Andy Fike, who was trained as a landscape architect. And so he gets it, right? And so he said, why don't you do a video about what it means to be working in an arboretum? You're not just working in a college campus, you're working in an arboretum. And so on uh, the dining hall project, the general contractor there said, oh, yeah, well, we'll show a video to every every worker that comes on site and they'll get a sticker to put on their hard hat to say, I know about the Scott Arboretum. I know about heritage trees. Now, is this 100 percent effective? I have to say, sadly, no. But it's a huge step um, in the direction of raising up the awareness and the appreciation. You know, what does it take to be a heritage tree? What do we mean when we say a heritage tree? So the other thing that I would say we've made great strides in is actually, you know, this is the nitty gritty, not sexy part of preserving things, but it is spelling out what you really need to do that. So having fencing that you cannot move having signs that say tree protection zone, having this communicated to all the subcontractors that come on site so they know what the ramifications are if they breach those fences or start storing stuff inside. Because, I mean, most people really don't understand how much of the tree is underground and what it means when you're running over the roots or compacting the soil or dumping uh, chemicals out into a root zone. So those are things that um, that we're working on. And I would say, uh, thanks to some understanding um, administrators, we've made incredible strides in, in the last um, handful of years. And again, with so much construction going on, it's it's critical for us to have a way to be able to try to convey that in a an effective overall way. Fantastic. Oh my goodness. That's so exciting to hear about the, the criteria as well as um, the communication systems, the importance of communication systems for all the people who are coming onto the property who may have an impact on it. Thank you. Um, and the other, so thank you, William. And then uh, Tina also asked a question about construction, which is when is the target date for completion? <laughs> it kind of depends on which project. So we've got multiple projects going on. So uh Actually, the college is very good. If you go on the Swarthmore College website, I think you could probably just uh, Google construction and many of the plans of drawings and timelines, those are on the college website. Um, it's about a 10 year plan for the geothermal well system because we have to connect all of the buildings to that system. So we're in phase one of that now. Uh, 
a major construction project that will be finished up next year. We have a beautiful new dining hall, which is a really wonderful example of indoor-outdoor relations. And I'm thrilled about the beauty of this building and, and how students now eating in that building have this incredible view over the Pine Needham and out onto our uh, lawn area and McGill Walk with these wonderful big old um, oaks. And they have a terrace. They can actually eat outside now. So um, again, a great example of kind of bringing the outdoors and the indoors together. And biophilia was embraced as one of the defining uh, design features. So some of the trees that we had to sacrifice for that building, they are memorialized inside the building as raw edge trim. Uh, a number of examples of kind of biophilia inside. So anyway, I'm getting off track with that. But uh, the old dining hall is now being converted into essentially a student union or a community commons. And so it is connected to the new dining hall. So it's still a construction site. So next year, um, that should be completed. Um, we had a biology building, Martin Biology Building, which is really kind of interesting to look at now because just the facade, the stone facade, fortunately, the stone has been, been saved. Uh, but most of the building was torn down and a new three-story addition will be added behind that stone facade. So kind of an art deco personality is being preserved for the face of that building. Uh, and in the end, it will lead to a enlarged pollinator garden, which was severely impacted. It's no more in essence, but it will come back. And the winter garden, which was severely impacted in that it's not there now, but it will come back and it'll be a better design It'll go down to kind of an arts plaza. Uh, and that is not to be completed until, blah, 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 I don't know, several years from now. Um, and so we have multiple projects that are going on simultaneously. Uh, and so to get the kind of the full details of that, I would invite you to go to the college website and take a look and, and you'll, you'll learn more about the designs and the, the timing of that. Excellent. Thank you. And I'm not seeing any more questions come through in the Q&A. So I'm going to ask one more question to wrap up our Q&A. Um, and it's it's one of my own, which is that throughout this conversation, I've been hearing a lot of things from you, Claire, about values and how values inform our landscape design and how they inform um, the ways that we, we approach and interpret landscape. And um, from from what I was hearing, sustainability is one of the values for the Swarthmore's, you know, Scott Arboretum. Uh, community, community involvement is one of them as well. What are some of the other values that you would say are the basis for your decisions in the formation of the Arboretum? And do you think those values are also applicable to to the general gardener who is watching today? So I think we're really in pursuit of beauty, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what, I think that's what motivates us. We, we're really on a basic level, we're trying to create art. We're trying to create something, uh, the beauty to delight and inspire us. And so, uh, I I have to say that is kind of underneath all of this, right? If it's if it's not beautiful, it might and, and that th therefore this kind of struggle with this new landscape, right? There are people looking at it going, oh, that's not beautiful. It looks you know it it looks unkempt. So as they all say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So part of it is educating, but I I do think we are. And, and beauty doesn't have to be exuberant, right? Beauty can be simple if it's good design. Um, but I would say, yeah, first and foremost, I think we're striving for creating beauty and an environment that we want to be in, um, an environment that we thrive in, that, that tickles our fancy, that we find refuge in, that we find delight in. So. Yes. Um, so if I haven't emphasized that value enough, um, then yeah, thanks for giving me the chance to, to lift that up. But 
uh, yeah, so certainly we're trying to build community and engage everybody. Uh, the public, the students, our volunteers, our members, uh, and uh, the sustainability uh, aspect uh, is, I think, coming through loud and clear. A lot of that being initiated by the college, giving the Arboretum to respond uh, in landscape ways to that. So, yep. Yeah. Does that help? Yes. <laughs> you, are, you are a really um, amazing leader. You're a great leader, not only for Scott Arboretum, but also for our profession. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just so thrilled uh, that you that you've received the award that you so much deserve. Well, I think, Holly, you know this, and I earnestly believe that I'm kind of reaping the recognition for uh, many, many people that have uh, lifted me up and stood behind me. So um, I've got a really talented staff. Uh, they are highly motivated. And uh, most of the time, I think I'm just trying to stay out of their way versus lead them. <laughs> We've got amazing volunteers and many gardens heavily depend on volunteers, but no other garden has volunteers as dedicated and hardworking as our volunteers. And we have members, you know, because we don't charge admission, right? We're free and open to the public. And so when we ask people, why are you a member? They say it's because I want to give back. And so there is this generosity of spirit and loyalty and support that come because people, they do value what this place is and what it means to them. And, you know, over the years, the example that the Scots set, we have had incredible gifts given that support us in a way that we can be free and open to the public. And we have a talented staff and we can take on a lot of free programming. Um, and it is, because of that generosity. So uh, as I've said, I, I was delighted to accept that award on behalf of all of those people who have uh, been a part of, of what I've been a part of for so long. Well, thank you. I know we're all really happy um, at the American Horticultural Society that Thanks. you, yeah, that you, um, were selected this year. So thank you for this fabulous program. And you all show, sure know how to throw a good party for uh, such oh, an event. It was a great <laughs> party. It was amazing. It really was. So it was uh, yes. So come back. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. If thank you. Courtney, I'll hand it to you. Of course. Thank you both so much. Claire, Holly, what a wonderful conversation about the meaning of College Arborita and um, what, what authentic means, right? What authentic means in the context of landscape. So thank you both so much. Um, and I'm sure that like me, people will have a lot to think about after this. And if anyone has more questions, I will pass them along uh, to you after we're clear. Um, all right, everyone, a couple of announcements before we end this webinar. For those of you who enjoyed tonight's program and would like to see it again, we plan to make the recording available very soon on our AHS YouTube page. So take a look there. Um, and if you enjoyed this evening's program, we encourage you to explore the fall winter semester of AHS lifelong learning programs. We have over 20 new fall and winter programs featuring internationally renowned horticulturalists and plant professionals who represent regions across the country. And many of our programs are virtual, virtual so no matter where you are, you can join. Uh, you can find out more about this and register on the AHS website. And just for a little sampling, our next AHS Lifelong Learning programs are one with Holly um, next Wednesday, October 11th. That one's at River Farm, and it's called Life of Learning in the Garden. And then next Thursday, October 12th, online, we have a program featuring our board chair, Scott Pline, called Land Development and Landscape Stewardship, and looking at the relationship between those two. And finally, we value your feedback and your ideas as we plan for the future of AHS programs. So immediately after this webinar, all registrants will receive a survey. And this will give you an opportunity to offer feedback on tonight's program, but also to share about your interests and preferences for future programs. So please take a couple of minutes to complete the survey. 
Well, thank you for spending the past hour with us, and we look forward to seeing you again soon at another American Horticultural Society program. Good night, everyone.